Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, I can say as much too. Microphone. I start with that. Okay, so yeah, um, uh, hello and welcome everyone um, online, but in particular, of course, also here to those folks who have made it in person. I think today we really have a, a special um, seminar. Um, uh, on, on image analysis hosted and moderated by Simon Norielke, who still rather recently has joined here as a lecturer and um, group leader in the Department of um, Systems Biology and is currently putting together a group of uh, bioimage um, analysts. And um, I think very excited about this opportunity of like running um, the seminar joint with um, um, Simon, because I think we have been running the CCB seminar for quite a while, covering a, a range of relevant topics in computational biomedicine. And we always wanted to cover a bit more of the ever more important field of uh, bioimage analysis. And, uh, uh, but we, what, we were missing someone with sufficient expertise in that space. And now with Simon, who is really a, a true expert in that space, I think we're really in a good position to, uh, to have such um, a part of the seminar. And I think Simon is intending to have a couple of talks there that will be focusing on leading tools for quantitative bioimage analysis. But I leave some more of the details and the scoping um, to you, Simon. So um, with that, maybe over to Simon, who is also going to introduce Use our speaker for today, with uh, uh, who will be Tally. But I just wanted to really say that I look very much forward to that, and of course also to the talk um, on Napari and on an administrative or organizatory note. We always need to uh, use the microphone, so if uh, folks are having questions, just repeat the question through the microphone. And if folks are having question online, please just use the chat um, of the Zoom. Um, and I think Tally also welcomes questions um, uh, during the presentation. All right, thank you. All right. Thank you, Ludwig. Thank you, Tali, for agreeing to be the first speaker in this new seminar series. Um, so this is going to be about image analysis and mainly sort of applied image analysis. And for that, we thought that we should start with something that, if not most, and at least very many people would be interested in. And Napari seemed like a very good candidate for that as a tool that is useful for in, in multiple fields and is currently being used by very many people. About Tally, I would say he's been my, yeah, I used to, you can still sit. <laughs> <laughs> about Tally, we've been uh, colleagues or neighbors for about half a year now. I joined half a year ago. Uh, Tally has been here for 10 years, nearly, since 2014, um, here at uh, Harvard Medical School, where he's an uh, associate director um, in imaging technologies. He is, as mentioned, a core developer of Napari, but he does many other wonderful things apart from teaching uh, at the Cold Spring Harbor Lab and microscopy course. He also has a, you will see if you visit his uh, website, fantastic sense of aesthetics. Um, and he is the author and father of the very popular FP base that I think he will mention briefly. I'm gonna skip your education because what we're really interested in is what you're doing right now. So please. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, if this is either too loud or too soft, I assume someone will tell me. I, I'm going to hold it right about there. Yeah. So thanks for having me. I really, I really appreciate the invitation to um, join you in this uh, seminar series. Um, yeah. So as, as Simon said, um, uh, my name is Tally. My, my background is in neurobiology, for what it's worth. Um, but I've been in microscopy for about ten years now. Um, sort of recognized that I liked the tools more than the questions I was asking. And um, so, so I came here to the Nikon Imaging Center um, uh, about 10 years ago. So mostly my job is working with uh, advanced light microscopy, um, light sheet microscopes and some super res, but uh, a lot of just uh, advising and collaborating with people on, on various um, quantitative microscopy experiments. Um, and I do a lot of teaching as well. Uh, but what I 
really have enjoyed doing a lot over the last probably five or six years is um, Python. I just am really into Python. And somewhere along the way, I caught the bug with just contributing to open source projects. And that, um, that got me involved with Napari, uh, which, which I'll tell you about. Um, before that, I did um, a thing called FPBase. Uh, FPBase is a fluorescent protein database. So one of the tools we use a lot in microscopy is uh, um, fluorescent proteins for labeling various uh, uh, targets of interest. And as a first step to an experiment, it was always sort of there's so many factors in deciding the thing. And so um, I made a website for um, helping, helping people discover and explore uh, those. So that uh, is that. Is that. Um, but yeah, like, like I said, I'm going to talk mostly about Napari. Um, and I do maintain and contribute a bunch of other projects, but I won't really talk about I'll talk about one of them today, but, but most of, mostly just Napari. Um, yeah, so Napari is a multidimensional data viewer uh, written in Python for Python. And um, started probably late 2017 um, uh, as, a, as a sort of brainchild between Juan Nunez Iglesias, who is uh, one of the maintainers of Scikit Image and uh, works in, in Monash, um, and his, his friend Loic, Loic Royer, who is a microscopist at, at Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. Um, and they kind of put a, a proof of principle together around a, a couple lower level technologies that I'll talk about, uh, mostly uh, VizPy, which is a open source uh, Python OpenGL based tool uh, for, for 3D rendering, and um, Qt, which is our, our uh, uh, GUI front end. Um, so about a year after that, I got involved and um, it has sort of exploded <laughs> since. And I would as much like to talk about what Napari is as I would what it is not, because I do think it has, um, it has received attention in sort of a, a, a strange explosive way, focusing on, on some things that I am not sure it is yet ready to deliver uh, and other things that I think it is quite good at that are not necessarily as, um, as aware. So, so I, it, it has been a little bit frustrating as a, as a sort of public relations kind of thing because certain parties took interest in it and, and, and blew it up as, as, uh, as sort of the next maybe image J of Python, right, if you will. And uh, we are very far from that sort of thing. And so, um, yeah, so as much about what it is, uh, I would like to just emphasize where we are and where we aren't. So the, the real motivation for Napari was to provide fast GPU-based um, visualization for multi-dimensional data sets so, um, in, in, in Python. So I mean, pretty much everything that I say here is going to have Python underlined. This is, um, you know, we have many great tools in lots of languages, but um, not necessarily in, in written in Python for Python. Um, uh, Python, of course, I don't have to tell you guys, is, is, is a rapidly growing language. It's sort of becoming the uh, lingua franca of, of, of science. And um, we have tools like matplotlib that are incredible for visualizing data. But I think if you've worked with multidimensional data, you, you kind of quickly hit this point where um, it just gets a little frustrating where, where um, you, you know, uh, matplotlib does have, say, three-dimensional viewing, but it can be a little slow perhaps, or, or navigating your multiple dimensions can just get clunky. And so one of the goals here was to just make a, um, something that can simply view multidimensional data uh, with no hard restrictions on the maximum number of dimensions. So in theory, we should be able to expand to 20 dimensions, give you a slider for every unused dimension, that, that type of thing. So um, no, no hard limits on the domain uh, that in, in which we're working. Um, uh, and yeah, to be GPU powered, um, so using OpenGL um, to, to make, us, you know, make, make, make use of the, of, of the GPU to um, really render as fast as we can. That I should, I should point out is really nothing that Napari itself has done. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, we lean very heavily on a library called VizPy. So VizPy is a, is a really awesome library. It's a um, uh, collaboration between four, four people who had done individual sort of attempts at, um, 
uh, bringing OpenGL. OpenGL, if you, if, if you, if I, I, if I guess I haven't defined that. OpenGL is a um, uh, open graphics language that lets uh, lets you get um, low level access to primitives and stuff on the on the GPU for rendering um, rendering data. And uh, a number of people were sort of tackling this OpenGL in Python angle, and they all got together. They had individual libraries, and they all got together and they made VizPy. So VizPy was one of these. Um, good stories of, of collaboration, and um, most of the uh, most of the really visually impressive stuff about Napari is actually VizPy, um, and Napari kind of wraps that to present a, a nicer API and maybe user experience. Um, but it's a lower level is uh, VizPy. But yeah, so the goal was to integrate well with the scientific Python ecosystem. To, so to have a tool that is there. Uh, you're doing your data analysis in SciPy, NumPy, um, Scikit image. And you would like to be able to open up something multi-dimensional data viewer uh, and then go back to the code. So it was really designed to be this kind of interactive back and forth uh, tool. Um, I would say it has gotten, it does have a GUI, it does, it does have a graphical user interface and it feels like an application. And I think the fact that it feels like an application and it is sort of an application has, it creates some of the um, identity crisis, if you will, because on, on the one hand, it feels like a like a, a double clickable thing that you open up and you never touch the code underneath, um, which wasn't necessarily in the original conception of the thing. Um, it's not that it can't do both, but um, it wasn't the original um, uh, uh, conception. I would say a goal has been to support arbitrarily large data. So obviously, um, so, so meaning like too large for memory, uh, perhaps remote. Um, this was something that I do a lot in my work. I, I with, with Lightsheet Microscopy, we generate, you know, data sets that are many tens of, of, of gigabytes and are hard to just simply review. Uh, this is something that I would say we have not done very well. We can sort of lazily load data. Um, uh, meaning, you know, you move the slider and it doesn't actually hit the hard drive to load that data until the last minute. Um, but I wouldn't say it does it particularly efficiently, and there are definitely tools that do big data better than we do. And that has been um, uh, something that has been harder to improve on than I think we had hoped. Um, people are working on it still, uh, but uh, it's not. If you open up a 20 gig data set, it will sort of choke and you will be sad. Um, yeah, uh, but also it's got a great community behind it. Um, some, some really good people with good attitudes. And yeah, so with that, uh, I will say what it isn't is um, it's not an image analysis program. So a very, very often we get the question, can Napari do tracking? Can Napari do, you know, segmentation or something like that? Um, and Napari itself doesn't really do any of these things. We, we, we want to, to design it to be pluggable so that you could bring in image analysis routines, but most of those routines, most of the things that are doing specific image analysis pipelines are other libraries like scikit-image, like scikit-learn, or, or uh, you know, the whole host of the scientific Python ecosystem. But Napari was meant to be the visualization platform around which we could uh, use those other tools. Um, uh, yeah, and I would say, you know, getting the most out of Napari at this stage in the development does require using Python in tandem with the GUI. So you will, you know, one will get much more out of it if, um, uh, if they're able to get their hands dirty a little bit in the code, um, and they'll be frustrated a little bit if they can. Uh, yeah, and, and so despite, you know, some of the marketing uh, around the project, I would say it's not ready for mass consumption by non-coders, in my opinion. It's, it's got a long way to go before it's sort of uh, Fiji, but just for Python. Um, but with that, let me give you a, a quick tour of, of what it looks like and the, and the sort of principal components, if you will. Um, it is built around this viewer, so uh, the, while it has a big... API, at the heart of it is this thing, the viewer. So you import Napari, uh, Napari viewer. Uh, you, make, you make this viewer object. And the viewer has, you know, like most viewers, it's got a canvas. Um, so this is where all your data will be displayed. Um, we have a layer list. I'll talk a lot about this. So um, Napari, uh, the core concept in Napari is layers. And I'm, I have many slides on this. Um, so just to summarize, basically layers are um, well, obviously, like Photoshop might have layers, these are just your, your various data components, you can toggle them uh, visually, but on a slightly lower level, they are our abstraction around various data structures. 
So we have layers for an image, a set of coordinates, um, vectors, shapes, meshes, that kind of stuff. Each, each sort of primitive data type has a uh, Napari layer that corresponds to that data type. And each layer has a set of um, common operations or visualization routines you might do with that type of data. So that's really the, the core concept of Napari and I'll, I'll dig into that some more. Um, but here on the left, you, you, you would just see all your layers. You can toggle them what type of layer they are. Each type of layer has its own set of controls. So an image layer would have um, contrast, uh, gamma, um, et cetera. Uh, labels layers are for things like segmentation. So there would be paint, paint tools, et cetera. Uh, you'll see all those. Uh, the dimension sliders, like I said, so, so here we're viewing a, I guess it's a, it's a four dimensional data set because it has two channels. Uh, X, Y, and then a Z dimension. And um, in the moment, we're not displaying the uh, it as a volume. We're just displaying it as as a series of two D images. And so, uh, so, uh, so a, an additional dimensional slider will, will show up there for however many un, unshown dimensions you have. You'll have sliders down at the bottom. There are add remove buttons for adding different layer types, and then various controls for toggling three D, etc., rotating and stuff like that. Okay, so like I said, layers are a central concept. So the, so, the, so, the, so the real core idea here is as you're going through an image analysis routine, you're going to have, um, generally you start with your image, but then you will have a number of, of products of, of your analysis, like segmentation, um, which might be best shown as an array of integers or labels, we, we, we call them here, um, or perhaps points. So uh, a set of coordinates in n-dimensional space. And each of these has, um, its own layer type. So yeah, let me just dig into a little bit what, uh, what those can do. And yeah, please do stop me, raise your hand, or just holler at me at any point if you have any questions. Um, right, so the image obviously is, is one of the most important layers. By image, we simply mean a dense array of, of intensity values. They could be integers or floats, just, just they need to be regular gridded data. Um, and as I said, um, n-dimensional is, is at the core of it, um, but this button down here on the bottom left uh, toggles between 2D and 3D. So in 2D mode, you can sort of pan and zoom around everything, as you would imagine, and in 3D mode, uh, click, then we can, we can rotate in. So um, yeah, so that, that's an obvious thing that we wanted to be able to do, and uh, that is that is what the image layer does. I don't know that there's anything else being shown here. Yeah. Um, it does support um, multi-resolution data sets. So, so a common thing to do if you have really big data is to um, uh, uh, downsample your data at various uh, pyramid levels. So you would have your, your full resolution and then you would make a, another set that was downsampled by 2x and then another by 4x and then 8x. This is sort of what Google Maps does. Um, that lets you uh, infinitely zoom onto uh, a bit of the earth and see it at very high resolution. And then when you zoom out, of course, it's not loading the entire earth at that, uh, at that zoom level, it loads a downsampled version. Um, and Napari is ready to handle that, that sort of data. Um, so in 2D at least, actually, this is a case where we've done an okay job at, 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 at loading um, relatively big data. So here's an example here. I, I don't know if you can see on the bottom left here, there is a zoom number six, five, four, three, two, one, as they're zooming into, I think this is a COVID data set, I can't remember, um, uh, of just um, pyramid data and EM data. I would say in 3D, where you would really want this to happen is a place we do not yet do good uh, chunked loading. So um, that is something that people are working on, but has been we have been working on for years. So once you have this is um, uh, if any of, if you, if any of you have used other image analysis programs like Amaris, Amaris does a good job at um, Amaris. Of course, is commercial software that costs many tens of thousands of dollars. Um, we'd like to be able to give you something like a free uh, open source version of Amaris, but um, that is definitely still uh, a ways away. Um, we, we can also support lazy loading um, of, of uh, dynamic loading of remote or, or big data. And most of that is done by using a library called Dask. So Dask is a, um, Dask is a great Python library that 
wraps a number of APIs like NumPy or Pandas, and, and, and essentially it does many things, but one of the core things it can do for us here is uh, lazily load data. So you could have an object that feels like a, a standard Python NumPy array, uh, but doesn't immediately load the data until you ask for it. So by wrapping an array in this library Dask, um, essentially what, what this library, what this video is showing here is that this is a large um, data set that I collected on, on our, our Lattice light sheet. Uh, and um, what's happening here actually as it goes through is each time point, uh, it's loading the data from disk. It is doing an operation to ap apply some geometric transforms to it. And then it is deconvolving it um, on the fly. So uh, the reason that's sort of useful for us is because um, without this type of thing, typically we would collect a bunch of data and then save various pre-processed states <laughs> so that when we want to view it, we didn't have to do all this again. And that means basically the raw data might be 50, 50 gigabytes, and then the de-skewed data might be 200 gigabytes, and then the deconvolved data might be another 200 gigabytes. And so for what really should have been something like 50 gigabytes on disk, you're, you're saving something like you know 500 or, or 600 gigabytes on disk. And um, by encoding all of that step as a, as a lazy process when you view the data, you do lose a little something because now it loads a little bit slower, but you gain a, a ton of, of storage space. So um, it's, it's a trade-off and different applications would want different things, but um, Dask makes it very easy for Napari to just do that without Napari having to do much at all. So if you haven't looked into Dask, check it out. Uh, okay. So labels uh, are, are our name for masks, integer arrays, Boolean arrays. Um, uh, here, um, the, the, the colored layer on top of the image is essentially uh, a labels layer where the uh, integer ID uh, corresponds to some you know, uh, identity of some object in the image. Um, there are all the sort of standard uh, painting tools you would imagine. So when we click on the uh, labels layer, we get a paintbrush and we can um, edit, uh, delete, update, stuff like that. Um, so with, uh, one, you know, one of the main motivations for Python, of course, is machine learning. Obviously, machine learning is, is uh, influencing everything we all do, and um, it, is, it is dominated, it, it, you know, Python is, is really the, the main language for machine learning. Uh, so getting modern machine learning techniques into the image analysis routine is, is it somewhat greases the wheels to do that directly in Python. So um, many of those machine learning techniques also need some sort of ground truth where there's a human in the loop annotating data. Um, and so a good deal of effort went into making this um, usable for, for people to open up an image and, and generate uh, ground truth data sets for, for training or, or uh, validation of, of uh, machine learning. This also works in uh, 3D as well. So this is a brain, uh, uh, brain map from the Allen Institute um, that just is, is showing 3D labels as well. There is some recent activity to even do some 3D editing. So uh, it, it's particularly difficult when you have a large ND data set to do um, dense annotations. I, I don't know if anybody has, has struggled with this, but if you, um, you know, one, one very laborious way would of course be to step through every single 2D plane, label the thing, go to the next one, label the thing, go to the next one, and that can just get very uh, exhausting. Um, so facilitating that by, you know, either interpolation or just other heuristics and, and, and tricks for annotating in 3D or even 3D picking sometimes. If you have a, a sea of objects and you want to pick one object out of 3D, um, uh, knowing what your mouse is clicking on when you when you click on a on a 3D projection um, can be sometimes a little tricky, and those are things that people are working on in, in the library right now. Um, points points are of course just locations in some n-dimensional space. Um, here is another place where VisPy really shines. So what you're looking at here, I think, is a million or two million points, each of which has a different um, location, shape, uh, color. Um, and they so so each each object in a in a Napari uh, layer can have features associated with it. So if you had additional metadata, some you know whatever feature you have stored with various coordinates in space, um, can be encoded in styles, whether that be color or size or um, text. Um, 
And that is pretty hard to access from the GUI, but there is a relatively rich kind of pandas style API for uh, associating various visual features with various data features. All right, uh, vectors are pretty straightforward, just <laughs> vectors in n-dimensional space. Um, so this is a pretty great data set from one of the other core developers, Alistair Burt. Uh, I can't even really remember. I mean, it's a, it's a 3D uh, electron cryotomogram, uh, HIV, and he basically has, um, he's demonstrating the orientation of, of various particles in the capsid and um, uh, with vectors. Uh, there is a tracks layer. So this is essentially a points layer that associates points over time. Uh, and lets you see, you know, the temporal or or other provenance of a point as it as mostly as it as it travels through space. Um, this also supports uh, 3D or ND um, viewing. This was contributed by uh, a guy named Alan Lowe, um, and he has a really nice plugin called Arboretum that uh, he uses to both show and interactively annotate lineages of cell uh, tracking experiments over. Um, over time. And here's an example of a, uh, I think that's a C. elegans data set uh, with nuclei tracked over time and just showing. It. Again, all the analysis done elsewhere. In this case, he's got a whole pipeline for cell tracking, um, but he, uh, you know, we're able to drop the, the, the product of the analysis into the drawer. Um, meshes and surfaces are supported. So here is essentially, you know, a 2D, in this particular case, we have a 2D manifold through 3D space, uh, but it can also have associated with it you know, higher dimensional information like an intensity over time. So this might be an fMRI uh, or, or other type of, of data set where you want to look at some activity on some manifolds in n-dimensional space over time. And lastly, just shapes. So shapes are uh, ve vector type graphics, like a, like something you, you could do with an SVG or just basically uh, any arbitrary polygons or, or, or anything that can be represented with vectors. Um, so, Let's see. Yeah, so that really, in, in my opinion, the, the, the core offering and the core conception of, of Napari really is an abstraction around these six or seven data types. So uh, Napari didn't create the, the visualization underneath it, that's VizPy, but it does create a nice um, uh, abstraction around common data types that one uh, tends to encounter in, in image analysis routines. Um, yeah. Are the uh, shape layers and the label layers like sort of interchangeable? Right? Philosophically, they can be converted one to the other. Um, they can be converted one to the other, but it's easy. So this is a dense array of of integers, and this is not. Um, this is a these are these are vertices with this is more of a graph layer, right? Vertices with edges, and this is a, a dense array of of stuff. You can absolutely create a shape and convert it to this, but I. Can't remember if you can go backwards. I, I would be. I don't think you can go backwards. Does that makes sense. The the difference. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. So, and I actually. So I, I, this is the thing I like the 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 most about Napari, and and it's the thing that I think could extend to a broader part of the community. I think it would be really great. Um, as uh, I don't I don't know if if anybody uses types and and uh, type hints in in Python, but I think uh, we could. I would like to see it sort of go to a place where we have canonical data structures that we all, uh, almost like protocols that we accept and recognize. And I can imagine this sort of thing being um, not just useful for visualization in Napari, but uh, um, uh, image analysis sort of protocols where you say, I take an image and I give you an image, et cetera. That wasn't very uh, clear, but okay. So um, like I said in the beginning, one of the main, um, Goals was something like interactive analysis, where uh, we, we very much want a tool that lets us go back and forth from the data. So what's being shown here, let me just start this again, is the console exists in the viewer. You can, of course, have it side by side too. But um, here I'm just demonstrating you know, something you might do on a regular basis uh, if you knew the code alone, which is just open up scikit-image, make a threshold. And then we add labels. You don't have to do this in the code. Let me see if I can pause this a little bit. Yeah, so, right. So um, 
Yeah, so, so a very common routine might be to just create a threshold, get the threshold, and then uh, layer data greater than threshold here. That is creating a, a threshold layer uh, or, or a labels layer, like a, a segmented product. And then uh, this viewer add labels, uh, viewer dot add something is like most of what you're doing in Nipari. You say viewer add uh, one of those uh, layer types. And so here it's going to create that new um, labels layer here, which you're now seeing in red. Um, you could have created one manually with this button uh, there, sorry, right there. Um, but then the point is to really be able to go back and forth between the two. So um, after we do that, um, here in the code, I am getting a pointer to the points layer. So let's see, a moment ago, yeah, I'll, I'll let it play. So there I click points, I get a new points layer. Now down here, I'm, I'm getting a handle on that points layer. Uh, I think I'm gonna look at the data, which at the moment is empty because there are no points. Now I can go in interactively and make some points with the GUI. And then when we come back and we look at that points data, now, now it's there. So the point is we're just sort of going back and forth from code to GUI. Um, that's really all I want to show you with this slide is that uh, it, it, it is um, intended to be interactive, to interact with your data, to modify your data in place or not, um, uh, and go back and forth. Um, for me, the sweet spot really is that. I, I, I think as, as we, anybody who's done a lot of data analysis knows that it's super important to look at the data and it is easy to get in the habit of not looking the, at the data sometimes. And so I think um, a big part of the mission here is just to a little bit make the process of, of looking at your data easier to do. Um, so I've really enjoyed it. Uh, this is um, some data I was doing for a collaboration recently where we were just trying to you know, find some objects, make sure that we were, um, uh, make, make sure that the radius I had estimated for the various objects was accurate and then um, I was uh, trying to just estimate their distance from the nucleus. And so all of these little visual uh, tools were, were just sanity checks to make sure that the analysis is going well, um, which uh, is, is a little, it, it, we aim to make easier uh, with, with these various layer types. Um, like I said, integration with the ecosystem is, is important. So, um, I don't know how terribly useful this is, but it is a demonstration of, of training a, a training a, a deep neural net with, um, let's see, in this case, I think it was based on TensorFlow, uh, but maybe it was PyTorch, but it doesn't matter. Here they're training the MNIST data set to denoise uh, some, some handwritten numbers. And the point is um, showing the loss in the training over time. So you can sort of, uh, here the slider is just going between various different, um, instances, I guess, as it as as the model improves itself over time. You could do the same sort of thing in TensorBoard. Um, so I don't know why you would do it here, but it is just uh, um, a, an example somebody made of, of integrating with a, a training network as it is training. Uh, you can install it with PIP or Conda. Um, I will just point you there. In general, if you would like to learn more to use it, um, napari.org is where all the information is. So. It is available on both uh, uh, PIP and Conda. Plugins, so yeah, so like I said, Napari itself doesn't really do analysis. It is a, it is a visualization platform, a hub. Um, uh, and I, I can't say that we necessarily explicitly said we wouldn't do analysis eventually, but it is how it sort of went where um, uh, and, and, it's a, and it's a reasonable, nice place to draw the line to say that, you know, uh, uh, functionality belongs in plugins, in analysis functionality belongs in plugins, and, and, and Napari itself is just a, a tool. But I would say this is a place where some of the conflict uh, uh, occurs, because as you open up um, everything to plugins, the cohesion sort of goes down a little bit. And so um, we are now in a place... Um, yeah, so outside of directly doing analysis, um, you know, in, in Python yourself, plugins are where, where uh, more uh, analysis functionality comes in. And right now there's about 300 plus plugins, which in my opinion is probably way too many for this stage of development um, because uh, it is, the, the plugin architecture is still just sort of kicking the tires of the thing. And um, 
it is a little hard for these plugins to talk to each other. Um, they, 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 they each kind of open up a widget, do a job. That's great. They, they dump some product of their thing into the viewer, but uh, the, the pipeline for really, you know, use plugin A, have it send some product to plugin B, and it send some product to plugin C is not quite mature enough, I think. Um, and so um, this, is a, this is a little bit of a, of a, of a point of, of, of tension because it is amazing that there has been so much engagement and you know, it's fantastic to have so many people working with and, and creating functionality for the part, but it would be a dream to see them all uh, more effortlessly work together. And it's not their fault, it's, 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 it's our fault for not um, having, a, a, having that ready. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's also sort of been underemphasized that I, I think I think there's a misimpression sometimes that in order to do any customization, you have to make a plugin. Uh, but you can do plenty of customization without a plugin just by hacking with the thing um, it, itself. Uh, but let me highlight some of, of the things that you can do. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned machine learning, um, particularly in image analysis, deep learning and machine learning has has really made some incredible uh, uh, tools, uh, many of them in the world, in the, in the realm of segmentation. So Stardist is a, is a plugin um, written by Martin Weigert and Uwe Schmidt um, in, in Germany. Uh, well, now he's in, in Switzerland. Uh, and it is a great tool for segmentation of nuclei. And um, it's, it is uh, based on, on, on uh, uh, TensorFlow. Um, they do have an ImageJ plugin, uh, but I think from the developer's perspective, it is easy. It is very easy if the thing is already written in TensorFlow to to slap a Python plugin in something. Um, it's a little bit harder to go across uh, language. Um, so we would, you know, I, I think I see it as a. It should encourage rapid prototyping. I think of of these deep learning um, tools. Uh, here is. You know, the point here is like they just open some images, uh, direct it somewhere to the input image, run the model, and, and get uh, a labels layer out that you could use to uh, analyze some nuclei. Uh, Napari Animation is a plugin that lets you do keyframe based animation. So, uh, if anybody has used Amaris, Amaris is very popular for this. Uh, keyframe animation is basically where you you position the viewer in some state uh, and you say, remember that state, and then you go to some other state. Maybe you go to a different time point, rotate the object, and you say, remember that one. And then to render the final video, you just smoothly interpolate between these multiple states. So um, here are a handful of keyframes. Then you might say, um, you know, rotate 90 degrees, zoom into this guy, then go over to that guy, zoom back out. Um, and put it in your keynote, <laughs> something like that, right? So um, this is, you know, it's funny for all of the, uh, uh, I mean, um, MRS, I, I keep mentioning MRS because it ha has been the, the, the de facto tool for these sorts of things for many years. And it is an incredible tool that probably gets used too often just to uh, make pretty animations at the end of the day, right? It can do a ton, a ton of things. And most of the people who have come in to use it kind of want to make a pretty animation for their, uh, their PowerPoint. Um, so this is a really nice thing to be able to do that. Um, yeah, like I said, there, there are so many. I just picked a random smattering to highlight. I, uh, this is a plugin I made that is an Omero client. I, I mention it just because we have an Omero server here. O Omero is a uh, image, uh, I guess you can call it a database. It is essentially, um, it is a place to store your image data associated with metadata uh, and with an API for um, uh, programmatic access and stuff. And so this is just a widget uh, wrapping the API to access. In this case, I am accessing the Harvard Omero instance, showing some, some thumbnails of what's on the server. And then if you double click on one of them, it will load. Now, this is one of the places where um, you can see it is a little laggy. This is definitely one of the places where our support for remote data is a bit frustrating. Um, uh, it would be ideal if you sort of saw like a down sampled uh, rapidly loading thing and then um, uh, and then gradually loading higher resolution as 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 it as it came. Um, but this is something that is not quite happening. And, and so it sort of feels like it's close, but not really terribly useful at the moment because of that um, limitation. Um, uh, this is a really a uh, cool plugin that uh, a guy, uh, Federico and Ian Hunt, Federico's in our group, is, he works on all the time and, he, and he, he's really 
uh, quite prolific with it, but this is um, driving a microscope. So Micromanager is open source software for running a microscope. And um, this is an example of just driving hardware uh, and showing the, the results um, in, in, the, in the viewer. Um, this is another plugin I really like um, that uh, kind of demonstrates exactly, I think, what we would have wanted to be able to do in Napari and, 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 and can do, which is to associate the products of some data analysis with, with a viewer. So here he's got, um, I guess, Drosophila embryos and has um, uh, clustered the nuclei that, you know, segmented them and clustered them based on some features. And here he's inter interacting with a, the output of a UMAP. Um, to say, show me where are these objects in in the in the viewer. This is something you can do with things like Bokeh and, and Altair. There, there are various libraries that, that do this, but um, here he, he brought it into Napari. Um, that's about it. I will I will highlight uh, a, another um, thing here called Magic GUI. This is not a plugin, but this is a library I wrote that I wrote to make it easier for people to either make plugins or just to use um, Napari uh, with some interactivity directly. So let me explain what this does. Uh, Magic GUI is a library that essentially maps types to widgets. So um, uh, if you, here's, here's sort of an example here. So uh, if you create some basic function and uh, you have um, various parameters of certain types. So here I have a function that takes two parameters, X and Y. I am declaring that X is an integer, even though I haven't given it a default value. Y, I am implicitly declaring as a string by nature of giving it a, a default value, but I haven't type annotated it. What magic GUI will then do is um, uh, take that function, look at the parameters. Uh, um, magic GUI, this is a decorator here that basically takes in the function and gives back an object with the same name as the function. And so down here, if I say some function, dot show this this function now is like a living object it, it becomes an instance of a widget that can show a user interface to gather those parameters that you said you need so it knows i need to show something for an integer so it shows a number box it needs to show something for a string so it shows a line at it and there's maybe 10 or 16 different data types that it can um, demonstrate uh, or show um, yeah, that, that's the rough idea. So, so the point here is, is sort of rapid prototyping of user interfaces. It's not meant for um, complicated interfaces. As soon as you need sort of a, a, a complex layout, this is not the tool for you. But um, uh, what it does let you do is, um, uh, I mean, I'll jump to this one here. So you know, if you have some function and you want to like optimize some parameters, for instance, um, uh, this is just a very, very silly basic example of, of, of a Gaussian blur. So the function over here is Gaussian blur. It says it takes an image, takes some sigma and some mode. And um, uh, Napari basically has built-in support for Magic GUI. So if you annotate a object, in this case, Gaussian blur takes an image and I am annotating it with a type that comes from Napari. So Napari has this image data type. Um, so by nature of doing that, it tells uh, Magic GUI to look in the layer list over here and give you the layers as, as, as available options in, in the first drop down there. So point being, we've got a function, it takes an image, maybe a, a sigma um, that is now represented as a slider and, and a mode that is, the, is, is one of a number of set choices, right? And so it gives you the appropriate widgets for that. You didn't need to know how to do any GUI programming. You didn't have to go into Qt, which is the, the, the main um, GUI framework we use, which is amazing and, and elaborate and, and complex. Um, but sometimes it is overwhelming for people who want to just get a slider up there and move a thing around um, when they're just trying to find what is the best parameter for something. Um, so a number of plugins do use uh, Magic GUI, but you definitely don't have to use it in a plugin. You can um, open up a viewer here, add an image, and then um, just there's a thing called viewer window add doc widget, and it'll just take one of these Magic GUI things. So that is a, um, it also doesn't have to be with Napari. You can use this outside of Napari. It supports multiple um, backends as well. So it, it, this is an example based in Qt because Napari is in a Qt environment, but you can also use this in Jupyter Notebooks. Um, 
So if you're if you're in a Jupyter environment, you can you can have Magic GUI create Jupyter widgets for you right there in the browser as well. Um, support for that is a little less rich as the the Qt widgets, but um, that 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 can do a thing. So I mean, the real the real sort of dream for for this project was to be able to take something like Scikit Image, which is a library of you know a tremendous number of functions for operating on images, taking a few parameters and, and outputting usually a new image or maybe a labels uh, segmentation result. Um, and uh, this, I, I sort of thought of Magic GUI as, as something that we hoped would be able to just give me, you know, uh, the entire Scikit image catalog and essentially pump out widgets. Um, and this is sort of a rough example of that where uh, this is just using the Scikit image filters module, which has a handful of filters like Gaussian blurring or, you know, Laplacian or et, et cetera. Um, and yeah, so that's the idea of Magic GUI. Uh, okay, so in in summary, I just want to uh, say that you know, so Napari is Python-based visualization tool. The emphasis is on n-dimensional data. Um, uh, these layer types are really the the core uh, the core conception, um, which are abstractions around common data structures. Um, and how they might be visualized very much in alpha stage of development. So, you know, expect breaking changes a little bit. I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, start to develop things that you want to work in eight years in Napari, but um, uh, we, we certainly do encourage you to try it and, and let us know what, what's good and what's not. Um, yeah, you know, if you're already doing a little Python, you're more likely to get more out of it. Um, uh, right. Okay, um, if you'd like to learn more, go to napari.org. Um, there are a number of tutorials there. You can, they're all in the tutorial section. Uh, there's a bunch of examples in the, in the GitHub repository itself, just showing how to do various things. Um, there's a new bias workshop that uh, we gave that has associated Jupyter Notebooks, stepping you through a number of kind of typical pipelines, like maybe open an image, do some segmentation, update the labels, you know, stuff like I showed you. Uh, and then, yeah, you can Google YouTube. So with that, I will thank you for your time and I will thank um, the many, many contributors. So a ton of people have contributed to Napari at this point, well over a hundred um, and many of the core developers are shown there. Thanks. Any questions? Questions? So if you are in a notebook, don't think it was not pushing the button. I agree. It's red. Push and let go. Push and let go. Okay. So if you're in a in a notebook environment, or maybe yep. even worse, if you are in Google Colab, like many people are with Python, yep. what what do you do? What can you do? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, with a somewhat frustrating answer. So um, the by nature of having sort of based this on OpenGL tech. Um, uh, there's sort of two questions. One is that this all is very possible and we could get this all in the browser. Uh, but the initial conception of the project was as a native, as, as a native desktop viewer. Um, so at the moment, if you try to do this in a remote collab instance, you will not be happy. It will not work. Um, you could, uh, so, so in other words, th th there will be no inline viewer in a Jupyter notebook. It will, if if you're local, uh, then it will open up a separate vi uh, viewer, and you're fine. Um, but nothing will show inline. If you're trying to do remote data analysis where your data is on the cluster somewhere, uh, and you don't want to bring all your data locally, um, you could you have basically two options. You either you know, uh, uh, VPN <laughs> into your cluster and just do a virtual desktop. Um, even that can be a little tricky because of um, the the GL based stuff. So some things supports. Uh, yeah, actually, most most v, most um, most VNC kind of stuff will work. What you can't do is something like uh, X11 forwarding. So so sometimes people will 
forward their, the, 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 the window from the cluster, this will not work because of the hardware, the GPU-based acceleration. So uh, either you share your entire remote screen or you use one of these kind of wrappers around remote data. So you could use Dask to kind of lazily load your remote data on a locally running Napari instance. That's not for Colab, that doesn't work that way. But um, so, so the answer is in Colab, you're kind of screwed. There's no, there's no way to get this up. Um, that said, uh, VizPy, the library that is doing the visualization under the hood, does have methods for um, doing what would, what is called a remote frame buffer. So you could, um, it's only, we're only a few hundred lines away from integrating into Numpari, but it is not there right now. But the way this would work is that essentially there is a remote cluster server running. Um, it's got the full viewer state. You rotate whatever you want to do. It essentially just renders that down to a, a little PNG, right? And sends you just the bytes and that gets shown in the browser. You could then indeed like click on that thing and rotate it around. And each time you do, it, it goes back and forth from the server saying, you know, they've, they've moved the camera, please render a, a, a rotated frame. And that does lag as you might expect, but not as bad as you might think. So you can get something on the order of 10 or 15 frames per second. So it doesn't feel like a native app, but it does, you know, you can have your full, all your data in its glory uh, running on a cluster and do some degree of multidimensional interaction with that in, in the browser. So that could be done, it's just not right now. Yeah. That's, that's probably the most common um, question that has been the saddest to have to answer uh, again and again and say, no, sorry, yeah. Thanks, uh, can you elaborate on your vision in order to kind of catalyze this plugin development in the next years uh, for Napari? Say that again. I would say my, my vision to catalyze what? Like the plugin development, like you mentioned ah. this kind of booming explosion of plugin development and what's kind of the vision of the developers in order to integrate yeah. all of this in the next years? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing that comes to mind about visions uh, and the plugin architecture is what I, what, what I had hoped we would be able to do, um, and we're still trying to do, but uh, yeah, what I had hoped we'd be able to do is have a more command-based plugin architecture. So, so let me tell you what it is and what I would like it to be. So at the moment, it's, it's mostly open a widget, drop it in the viewer, and that widget is, is, is like its own little world, right? It, it, can, it can do whatever Python it is in the hood and it's got some buttons and maybe it dumps something into the viewer and that's fine and good. But um, I, I, I would really like, honestly, I, my, 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 the, the architecture I, I was writing is based on VS Code's pattern. Uh, so if you, if you use VS Code, which is one of these integrated developer environments, just a coding um, program, it has a whole um, infrastructure of, of commands, essentially, right? Just some callable, right? That, that a plugin registers a series of callables that take some input, give some output. Um, and so what I would much rather have is, a, is, a, is, is plugins be little, little pointers to, to functionality, things that take inputs and give outputs. Those plugins could also, if they wanted, you know, provide a widget that triggers that. But what, what I would really like is, to, is for Napari to have more direct handles onto the functions, not, not give you a widget that lets a user click a button that does a thing that we don't know anything about. And the reason I want that is because if, if we had that, it would be much easier to um, uh, essentially do something like the macro recorder in image J, right? To, to, to do something where as the user does a thing, either programmatically or in the GUI, um, we can essentially um, chain together a series of events and uh, output that to a script. We could encode you know, versions and make a more reproducible <coughs> workflow. It is very, very hard to make a reproducible workflow when somebody just opens the thing, clicks some buttons and close it, and we have no idea what they did, right? Um, that's kind of where my brain goes. Is that what you were looking for or, yeah, yeah. Just a super quick follow-up on yep. these plugins. I was just curious whether you see any themes arising in these variety of, of plugins. Do people focus on certain things? Are there any like groupings, uh, uh, yeah. uh, mechanisms in, in, in place, an ontology or something? That is a good question. I probably am aware of 
40 of the 300 plugins. So I, I don't even I don't even know that I, I would be uh, doing it justice to 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 do that. I, I think let's see. Um, I mean, most of them have really focused on visualization, as you might expect, right? Um, uh, uh, and segmentation, actually. Segmentation is a big one. So yeah, that, that probably is, is the highlight. So um, there are some tools for EM-based segmentation. There's one called Empanada um, that, uh, is that what it's called? I think that's what it's called. Um, uh, Cell Pose, Stardust. Many, many, there are many very successful libraries for segmentation, and all of them have have um, not all of them. Many of them have have ported some variant of that to Napari. So segmentation is a big one. Um, simply just sort of rendering data in a cool way or annotating uh, data. Those those are those are some of the biggest uses. I I don't feel like I have a very good answer to that because I, there are so many plugins that I've never seen. So oh, I should mention I didn't mention it. Um, the uh, Napari Hub. So Napari Hub. This is a um, uh, service from CZI. They, they made a, a index essentially for plugins. So if you do want to look through plugins, you can, you can go check out um, plugins there and maybe you'll have a better answer to that question after you, if you look through there. Yeah. Did you have a question? I saw your hand up. Oh, one yeah. question online here maybe. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah, the, the question from the virtual audience is when new data formats or cloud providers come out, do you envision your team doing the development for support or do you expect the plugin framework to handle that? Uh, okay, so one of the main plugin types, uh, I should have mentioned this. So I, I, I did emphasize widgets a lot, but uh, readers and writers are, are a main type of, of plugin. So um, if I understand the question, question correctly, um, as, as new data formats come out, we would expect someone to write a plugin for them. So, um, for instance, uh, you know, there's a ton of biological, you know, image formats. There is a great library called um, AICS ImageIO from the Allen Cell Institute um, that uh, has support for for a ton of different um, formats. And then, of course, there's Bioformats, uh, which is still a, a Java-based library, but there is a, a wrapper that lets you run a Java. You know, if you if you, if you have a Java process running in another process, to um, to, to, to leverage that and, and use it in Napari. But to answer the question, if I understand it correctly, um, Napari itself is not doing any um, native support for proprietary or any, you know, any kind of file formats, but we do make a relatively simple um, uh, way to inject new uh, inputs and outputs in, into the data. And if I didn't understand the question, uh, hopefully they'll, they'll comment. Yeah. Um, just kind of a trivial performance thing. So your, um, your volume renderings were beautiful and fast. Uh, is there some scale on which it kind of keels over a billion voxels, 10 billion voxels, or if you have enough memory in your machine, are you just good? Yeah, no, good question. Um, yes, that, that's a great question. So yeah, if you can get it on the GPU, you're golden. Um, the, the bottleneck is to and from the GPU. So if you've got a, you know, if you've, the, the, you know, I, yeah, it all depends on, on the data size, of course. But like, if you've got a, a, a 16 gigabyte GPU and, and you can get it up there, then, then you're fine. So, you know, I, I, I would say the happy state is somewhere, you know, I, I can do fine with 2K by 2K by maybe a few hundred planes. Um, that, that, that's, that's fine. Uh, as soon as we start getting to gigavoxels um, uh, or, or, you know, many, many, more, yeah. Once you're once you're loading to and from, it, it, it will it will choke a little bit, and that is where pyramid sort of rendering would be just brilliant yeah. in in three D. Yeah. Oh, that makes yeah three D pyramid would be great. Yeah. Um, an unrelated thing, uh, I spent a lot of time the last week or two fooling around with GPT four, as I'm sure many <laughs> have. And uh, one thing that particularly impresses me is the ability to translate languages and to just generate code that. Does all of these kinds of file I/O type things yeah, just yeah. trivially, and so I'm wondering if it's about to get way easier to you know keep all the plugins up to date or whatever that, that deal with any file format under the sun because GPT will just take care of it for you. 
Man, I, I am I am with you. I have been so impressed with. I, I wouldn't say I have it is deeply integrated into my workflow or anything, but I do have like GitHub Copilot, which is the you know that style thing in in VS Code, and it just blows my mind how how useful it is. And I do sort of imagine that in ten or twenty years, you know, language syntax just sort of disappears, and it becomes more just about like understanding the semantics you want and and. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, when and how that kind of thing plugs in here. I, I you know, it's not nothing specific about this, of course, but I do imagine. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm just excited about that too. I, 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 I think you meant ten or twenty months. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, yeah, yes, you're right, and it's just going to keep getting better. Uh, yeah, no, I'm excited about that very much. Yeah. Another question from the virtual audience: When I have a question about the codes about Napari, including troubleshooting, where should I ask? Yeah, great. Um, so. Uh, two things. First, I would direct you to image SC. So image SC, um, I think I'm still sharing my screen, right? So image SC is this fantastic uh, forum um, that has, let's see, I'll, I'll, yeah, so basically all image analysis, um, uh, if you have any questions about image analysis, image SC is an excellent place to go. It is definitely not specific to Napari, but we are, you know, we are, we are right there. So Tons of people asking questions about Napari on image SC. I would say this is more about usage and um, uh, patterns. So if you're like, how do I do this? This is a, a good place. Um, if you have a bug uh, or you know, if, if, if something, if you feel like something is broken, then it would be GitHub um, Napari slash Napari. Um, so just look for Napari on GitHub. Uh, also, if you go to napari.org, all of these links are there. Um, so bug reports, go to GitHub, usage questions, probably image SC. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we're gonna stop here. Right. Thank you again. Thank you for having me.